Ladies and gentlemen, let's continue with chapter 11 on, uh, on heat exchangers. Uh, we are going to continue. We, we have already looked at an introductory le lecture on the different types of heat exchangers and how do we treat fouling at heat exchangers. <coughs> uh, and also the very important thing in terms of looking at the different terms that can make contributions to heat exchangers, and then also the fins, using the fin efficiency, uh, and the fin surface and the unfin surface. Now in general, when uh, we want to design or analyze heat exchangers, there are in general at least two methods that can be used. There are more than two, but only the two most common ones are summarized in your textbook and they are called the LMTD method and the next one is the effectiveness into you method. So today we're going to concentrate on the LMTD one. We have already introduced it previously when we've looked at the case of the constant wall temperature and we are going to put many of these work now together so that you can see where it comes from. With the previous lecture, we said that there are two different types of very simple type of heat exchangers, which are the parallel heat exchanger as well as the counter flow heat exchanger. Parallel flow and the counter flow heat exchanger. Let me use red and blue to indicate the hot stream and the cold stream. With the parallel heat exchanger, the hot stream will do something like that and that temperature can be T1 and that temperature T2 and then at the same time because the two streams are flowing in the same direction that temperature would be equal to T T3 and that temperature would be equal to T4. The temperature difference decreases as the flow passes through the heat exchanger. With a parallel flow heat exchanger, we will have a stream in the one direction, and then we will have a stream in the opposite direction. So, we, again, we can refer to that as temperature T1, and that one as T2, and that one T3 and T4. And you can use whatever nomenclature you want in terms of the T1s and T2s. You can also, for example, use this one as T1, that one as T2, T3, and T4. It doesn't matter. <coughs> now, when we've looked at this previously, we have looked at the fact that the temperature, this temperature difference between the wall and the other stream there's not a constant temperature difference. Normally the, the temperature difference is an exponential type of temperature difference. And then when we look at the control volume, we've done it previously, then we have found that we can actually write the heat transfer rate as equal to a heat transfer coefficient, the area, and the LMTD. Okay. Now, that would be if there's only one stream and there's a wall, now what we're now going to do is we are just going to say the heat transfer rate is equal to UA surface area multiplied by LMTD. So with the U, we take into consideration the stream on the other side. Now remember, the stream can be a convective stream, but it can also be a natural stream in terms of natural convection to the environment where this LMTD can be written as, very easy, that temperature minus that temperature, T1 minus T3 minus these two temperatures, T2 minus T4, divided by the ln of T1 minus T3, those two terms, T4 my, T2 minus T4. If you do it like that, you shouldn't get a negative LMTD. 
And the negative LMD typically happens if you don't draw a sketch for yourself. So always it really helps, I would strongly recommend it, that you draw a very simple sketch for yourself. And especially when we go to more complicated heat exchanges, and you're going to see why I recommend that just now. <clears throat> now for counterflow heat exchanges, it is exactly the same. The same equation, and again, the LMTD, and we're going to call this LMTD for counterflow, and this one LMTD for parallel flow, PF for parallel flow, CF for counterflow. And let's calculate the LMTD. Again, it is this temperature minus that temperature, T1 minus T3, minus T2 minus T4, divided by the limb of the two terms, T1 minus T3, T2 minus T4. So these two LMTDs are exactly the same, but it is because of the nomenclature. So depending on the nomenclature you're going to use, equations might not look exactly the same, but if you do the sketch, it is very simple to, to ensure that you treat it correctly. Okay. Now, this is the two most easiest types of heat exchanger, but what do we do if that is the heat exchanger, and I'm not going to show the detail now, it's a black box, where you've got a temperature stream going in, a hot stream as T1, and T2 going out there, something like that, and T3 going in there, and, oh, sorry, T3, and T4 going out. So arbitrary, the two streams, remember, they are not allowed to mix. If they mix, it's not a heat exchanger. And there will always be a hot stream and a cold stream. So how do we treat heat exchangers like that? Well, in terms of this control volume approach, nobody has so far managed to determine a general analytical equation that we can use for that temperature distribution. So, for that reason, we as engineers always think of how can we jippo stuff. We're going to say, well, for another type of heat exchanger, we are going to use a correction factor F multiplied by UA, and take note, the LMTD, as if, as if it is a counterflow heat exchanger. As if it is a counterflow heat exchanger. Now, once you've made that decision, it's a counterflow heat exchanger, then you're going to say, well, schematically, that must be the inlet temperature, and that must be the outlet temperature. T1 must be higher than T T2, do you agree? Okay. And then T3 is entering here, and T4 has to exit there. So you force it to be a counterflow heat exchanger. Doesn't matter how complicated the geometry is. Right? So once you've done that, then the LMTD for the counterflow heat exchanger again would be T1 minus T4 minus T2 minus T3. divided by the limb of those two terms, T1 minus T4, T2 minus T3. Okay? So yes, this equation now looks exactly like this, but it is just because the choice of my inlet conditions. <clears throat> I could have started with a cold stream and used that one as T1 and T2 and T3 and T4. But just use the discipline. Once you've drawn a sketch like this and you look at the two streams, which one is the highest temperature, it is very easy to correctly write down the LMTD. Now, 
The question is now, where do we get this correction factor? Well, the correction factor, F, this value here, is given in literature, typically in figure 11.19 in your textbook. I'm going to show it to you just now. It is given for a certain geometry and to distinguish between the hot stream and the cold stream or the two different streams, it actually uses a capital T1 for, in this case, the shell and for the tubes, they use T1 and T2 lowercase. So there's a sketch like that. Okay. And for that specific sketch, there are, there's a graph that gives the correction factor F for different values of R and for a value of P. Now where does this R and P come from? Well, very simple. Just go and look at the sketch and the graph. The graph will actually show this value of P and R. So for this specific case, R is equal to capital T1 minus T2. So it is that temperature minus that temperature divided by small lowercase temperature T2, the outlet temperature minus the inlet temperature. So that is R and P is equal to lowercase T2 minus T1 divided by, take note, uppercase T1 minus lowercase T1. So this is not a general rule that it is always like that. It is dependable on the geometry. You don't have to remember it out of your head. It's in the textbook, it's in the graphs. So once you've got P and R, it is very easy to go and get the correction factor. So as an example, in your textbook, this figure, 11.19, there are four examples given to you. On the, on the left, shell and tube heat exchanger, a one shell and two tube pass heat exchanger at the top left, and the bottom left, a two shell, four tube heat exchanger, and then on the right hand side, two cross flow heat exchangers, unmixed and mixed. Just these four cases, there are mon many more available, and if you would like it for other configurations, then you need to go and look in literature to get these values for. Okay. Any questions on the LMTD method? Okay. If not, let's do an, an example. And this example is going to be a two shell pass and a four tube pass, shell and tube heat exchanger. Let me draw it schematically. Like that. Fluid would go into the shell all the way through, it will come back, therefore a two shell pass, and then four two passes, going in like that, going out like that, in and out, four of them. And in this case, we've got some glycerin, at an inlet temperature of 20. Its outlet temperature is 50. Therefore, it is being heated. It is being heated by water entering the tube at a temperature of 80 degrees Celsius 
and the exit temperature is 40. The tube diameter is 20 moles and the total length of the four tube passes is 60 meters and we are very lucky because they're going to give us the heat transfer coefficient of the shell is 25 watts per square meter degree Celsius and for the tube it is 160 watts per square meter degree Celsius. And we have to calculate the heat transfer rate before fouling and then the heat transfer rate if we have fouling on the outside of the tube with a resistance of 0 0.0006 watts per square meter degree Celsius. Two shell pass, there's the shell, so the water would flow through the shell once and twice. Let's use the red chalk to show that, so it will flow through there and then out there. Okay. Well, with the blue, oh no, it's the opposite way around, sorry. Okay. So my red and blue are not correct now. Let's just turn them around. Four tubes like that. One, two, three, four times that it passes through the shell. Okay. Glycerine at 20, 20 degrees Celsius. It is being heated to 50 degrees Celsius. How is it being heated? By water at a higher temperature, 80 degrees Celsius in a temperature and 40 degrees Celsius outlet temperature. This tube diameter is 20 millimeters and they also tell us it's a thin tube. They don't even give the wall thickness. And with typical copper tube it is less than a millimeter or close to a millimeter. Total length is 60 meters. <clears throat> the shell side heat transfer coefficient, so here on the outside, is 25 watts per square meter degree Celsius and the tube size, the tube heat transfer coefficient that's on the inside there is 160 watts per square meter degree Celsius. Normally you would have to determine this yourself, most probably because of the mass flow rates which are given and then you can calculate it with the equations of Nusselt number as a function of Reynolds, Brunel, something. We have to calculate the heat transfer rate before there's any fouling and then after a period of time we're on the outside of this tube. I'm just going to show it here schematically. The outside of the tube like there, there's a fouling with a value of 0 0.0006 watts per square meter degree Celsius. Right, something that we're going to need is the surface area of the tube for that is because that is where the heat transfer occurs. Pi multiplied by the diameter of the tube and the length. Pi, the diameter, is 25 millimeters. The length is 60 meters. And it will give us a surface area of 3.77 square meters. Let's look at if we force this heat exchanger to be a counterflow heat exchanger. Okay, so my red and blue are now incorrect, but the highest temperature is 80. 
Okay, that's the highest of all of them. So if we choose that as 80, our outlet temperature for that stream is 40. So that's 80 and that is 40 for the hot stream. For the cold stream, the inlet temperature, take note, the inlet temperature is 20. So if we look at that, if that is 40, then 20 should be about there. And the outlet temperature is 40. So mm, 20 and 50. Uh, Eighty and forty, twenty and fifty. Sorry, there's fifty. So there's forty. There's fifty about. So it is something like that. Twenty and fifty. Am I right? Like that. So now we have forced it to be a counterflow heat exchanger. Once we've done that we can calculate the LMTD as if it is a counterflow heat exchanger. The LMTD is 80 minus 50, that temperature difference, minus this temperature difference, 40 minus 20, divided by the ln of 80 minus 50, and 40 minus 20, and that will give us an LMTD of 24.7 degrees Celsius. Okay, yep, question? So where did you get that 0 0.025? The zero point? At 25 millimeters is the tube. Oh, sorry. I can't remember now if it's 20 or 25, but if you can just check for me. So it might be either 20 or that one should be 25 also. So if you do the calculation 20 millimeters, you get that answer. 20, okay, great. Okay. So it should be 20. I'm just checking if you're awake. Okay. Got it? Right. Now, in terms of what I've showed to you, is that we need to calculate the heat transfer rate with this equation. We've got this, this term. We've got U. We will get, uh, we've got the area. So those are the two things that we still need to calculate. Let's start with the, with the F value, the correction value. <coughs> and with that one, Schematically, in the textbook, they've got a sketch like this. Okay. With the tubes like that. And in that sketch, they show this as the inner temperature, is T1, and that temperature is T2. While this temperature is capital T1, and that temperature is capital T2. Okay? So, geometrically, this and this doesn't look the same. But, the inner temperature of the shell, the inner temperature of the shell is 20. The outlet temperature of the shell is 50. The inlet temperature of the tube is 80. The outlet temperature of the tube is 40. Okay. So just go and put it there. I would always recommend use a sketch. And then on figure 11.8, for that specific geometry, the two shell pass and the four two passes, we can see how we should calculate P and R. 
There, the equations are given with the th green dotted line around it. And it shows that P is equal to T2 minus T1 divided by capital T1 minus lowercase t1, and r is equal to uppercase t1 minus t2 divided by t2 minus t1, lowercase. We just have to do the calculation now, 40 minus 80 divided by 20 minus 80, so that is equal to 0.67, and this one is 20 minus 50 divided by 40 minus 80, and that is 0.75. Okay. At those two values or in the sketch, you can get the friction factor of the correction factor as 0.91 and that then follows from figure 11.9b. Do you agree? Okay. Now the first case without fouling, the total heat transfer coefficient we can write as 1 divided by, in terms of what we did yesterday, 1 divided by the heat transfer coefficient on the inside, the area on the inside, plus the limb of the diameter ratio divided by 2 pi kL, plus 1 divided by the heat transfer coefficient on the outside, the surface area on the outside, without any fouling. So that comes from the heat transfer rate is equal to <coughs> Uh, the delta T divided by the resistance, and this is my resistance term. Now, we're going to get to a very simple equation, but it is not good to start with that simple equation because it's not always valid. Because it is a thin tube, the wall is very thin of a 20 mole. If it's very thin, then the inside area and the outside area of the tube would be the same, okay, firstly. And the outside diameter divided by the inside diameter must be equal to 1, or very close to 1, 0.999 something. And the lin of 1 is equal to 0. Therefore, if we take that into consideration, that term is negligible. And then also this area and that area are the same. So in this case, the overall heat transfer coefficient reduces to the very simple equation of 1 divided by the heat transfer coefficient, 1 divided by 1 divided by the inside heat transfer coefficient, plus 1 divided by the heat transfer coefficient on the outside. And that is equal to 1 divided by the heat transfer coefficient on the inside has been given as 160 plus the heat transfer coefficient in the shell is 25. Always as engineers we have to look at these two terms. Because if you do that you will immediately realize that the heat transfer coefficient in the annulus in the shell is low, so if you want to improve the performance, then this is going to give you the best improvement with normally a little bit of money. Okay, so if you calculate this, then it is equal to 21.6 watts per square meter degree Celsius. Now we have everything to determine the heat transfer rate with. It's equal to the correction factor, UA, the surface, multiplied by the LMTD, 
as if it is a counterflow heat exchanger. The correction factor is equal to 0.91. The overall heat transfer coefficient is 21.6. Surface area, based on 20 millimeters, is 3.77. And the LMTD is 24.7 and that is going to give us 1,830 watts or about 1.83 kilowatts as an engineering answer. You follow? Okay, that was the first part of the problem. The first part of the problem was to determine the heat transfer rate without fouling now we're going to add some fouling to it. So with a fouling, then the only thing that's now going to change is the overall heat transfer coefficient. It is one divided by one divided by the heat transfer coefficient on the inside, the area on the inside. There's no fouling on the inside, you can write it there, but they didn't give us any value, plus the limb of the diameter ratio divided by 2 pi KL, plus, and now the fouling term, the fouling on the outside, divided by the surface on the outside, plus one divided by the heat transfer coefficient on the outside to the area on the outside. Okay. Now again, we are s the wall is thin, except if the fouling is so thick that we need to take that into consideration. But they didn't give us any information. They didn't say the fouling is 10 millimeters thick or something like that. If that was the case, then this area is not equal to that area. Inside is equal to outside. And then you can calculate the inside area and the outside area, and you can substitute it in the equation. So that's the first thing. And then secondly, still, because it's a thin wall, the two diameters, inner diameter and the outer diameter, is about the same. Therefore, this ratio is approximately equal to 1. So the limb of 1 is equal to 0, and therefore that term is negligible. And because the inner area is equal to the outer area, we can remove all the areas. So again, we're going to reduce this to a very simple equation. Take note, that's not always the case. <laughs> it's not always the case divided by 1 divided by the heat transfer coefficient on the inside plus the resistance of the fouling on the outside plus 1 plus 1 divided by the heat transfer coefficient on the outside. There you go. Okay, so the overall heat transfer coefficient with a fouling can now be calculated as 1 divided by 1 over 160 plus 0 0.0006 plus 1 divided by 25. And the overall heat transfer coefficient now changes a little bit, not that much from 21.6 to 21.3, so the fouling is not that severe. Of course, the heat overall heat transfer coefficient is now lower, as we can expect, it cannot be higher. And then we can calculate the heat transfer rate as the correction factor U multiplied by the area, surface area, the LMTD as if it is a counterflow heat exchanger. The correction factor is 0.91. Overall heat transfer coefficient is 
The surface area is 3.77, and the LMTD is 24.7. And that would give us a value of 1,805 watts, or 1.81 kilowatts. So a little bit of a decrease in the heat transfer rate, but not that much. OK? Do you follow the LMTD method? OK. Now with this problem, we took a shortcut. We took a shortcut in the sense that these two values were given to us. Most probably in the exam, I'm not going to be so kind. I'm going to expect of you to calculate it because then I can take into consideration to check the work that you've done in chapter 8 on internal force convection. Now, for this tube, it is very simple. Okay. You can use the equation that we've, or that we've recently published this year. Not the Dieters and Boulter and the Glinsky, etc. They are not accurate enough. However, what are you going to do when you get into the shell? There's no equation available. And that happens in many cases. When you change this geometry, in many cases, there is no information available. So when you get to an annulus and there's no information available, then you're going to say, well, I'm going to consider this problem as if it is a tube in tube heat exchanger. As if. And for the annulus, I'm going to calculate the hydraulic diameter. And for that one, you will also have to calculate the hydraulic diameter. Okay. If it is just a tube in tube, it will be just the difference between those diameters. We've done it previously. But for a complicated geometry, something like the one that we've looked at, or maybe you've got a geometry like this, You've got the circular tube. For that, all the equations are available. But for that one, the equations are not available. Again, then you can calculate the hydraulic diameter. Now, once you've got the hydraulic diameter, then there are two things that you can do. You can then consider that with that hydraulic diameter just as the new diameter. And you can use the existing equations to estimate the heat transfer coefficient. But there are three other possibilities that you can do. Firstly, okay, so you use the hydraulic diameter, and then you use the circular equations. So the equations of Nusselt number is equal to 0.013 Reynolds to the 0. Uh, wah, 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 and Pronel to the third. That equation. That's the first possibility. The second possibility is, in your textbook, there's a table 11.3. Very limited information which is available. But in that table, it gives you the diameter ratio, and then it gives a Nusselt number on the inside and a Nusselt number on the outside. And where's this Nusselt number on the inside and the outside? These values would be for the inside of the tube on that wall and on that wall. So everything is on that wall. And in your textbook, there are about 10 values that you can use. So it's not very accurate, but you can use that. Mm. Yeah, that is a, well, that is a, a, a challenge. <laughs> so I will consider it as if it is, a, because it's a shell, you know, if you look at it normally, they would also manufacture it in a circular area like that and then they would do something like that, <laughs> okay? 
So, and then there's the innate going to be. Now, that innate where it flows in there, you're not going to consider, but the rest of that you're going to consider as if it is a half circle, half circle. And then you're going to say the hydraulic diameter is four times uh, what the wetted area divided, no, I can't remember, four times, what's that equation? Okay. Four times the one is, I think, that area, and then it is also the wetted, I think something like that. Okay. So then you just need to go through the motions you calculated. Okay. So in terms of getting the hydraulic diameter for something like that. So that's the one approach that you can follow. And then we've, when you've got the hydraulic diameter, there are also more information that we have published Professor Dirke, he was also my undergraduate student, and he did his uh, research project also under my supervision. And then later on, we did it as his master's. So you can go and look at the work of Dirke and Meyer. There are many equations that has been published for Anili, and that would be in 2002, 2004, 2005, and then later on we, we supervised masters and PhD students together, and up to recently there was some work published. So you don't have to do it now for this course, but for those of you doing your research projects, there are actually much more information available on Anili. It is unfortunately not so easy just to go and estimate the hydraulic diameter and to use that in circular equations. There are many reasons why that doesn't work that easily. But for the purpose of this module, you can use table 11.3, that's fine. Or the first approach by calculate the hydraulic diameter and then just substitute it into the turbulent equations if, of course, the flow is turbulent. Any questions? If not, ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much. With the next lecture, we will continue with the effectiveness into you method.